Um, I'm uh, Daniel Burroughs, and I'm giving my talk on uh, correlating network attacks uh, from distributed. Is that better? Is that better? Okay. Well, as I say, I'm uh, Daniel Burris, and I'm going to uh, be talking a little bit, uh, a little bit less than I thought, about uh, uh, correlating uh, information gathered from distributed intrusion detection systems. Uh, this has been uh, this work I've been doing while at the uh, Institute for Security Technology Studies at uh, Dartmouth College. So uh, first, I'm just going to give a little bit of background on uh, ISTS, where I work right now. It's a uh, security and counterterrorism research center that's funded by the NIJ, which is the research arm of the Department of Justice. Its uh, main focus is on computer security. And uh, the group that I work in is the Investigative Research for Infrastructure Assurance, which is mainly an engineering-based group, uh, which is done jointly with the uh, Thayer School of Engineering up at Dartmouth College. So, kind of uh, just to give a kind of an overview of uh, what we're trying to do with this system, talk about the needs and the goals of it a bit. Um, in general, just to give like a kind of a nutshell picture of the internet and what's going on out there. We have uh, some systems that are connected out there that have little or no defense on them. Some people that might be a little more concerned with their security, they put up uh, firewalls, various types of defensive mechanisms. And then you've got others that are out there running a bit more information gathering systems, either IDS or other types of network sensors that are gathering a bit of information about what's going on out there. And of course, we've got the people that are out there trying to get into everything. So. When, so we might see alerts occurring on some of these systems distributed across many networks, and we're trying to gather this information and find out if it's related and rearrange the information gathered from these distributed systems to make the job of the security analyst a little bit easier. So the first thing we're trying to detect are distributed and coordinated attacks. Either a attack coming in from uh, many places or many people trying to attack one site simultaneously, or possibly a uh, single group or single person that is going after uh, multiple sites that have some sort of relationship between them. So these have been, of course, increasing in rate and sophistication. These are, whether they're the um, sort of the more automated ones, like the worms, like uh, some of the, like the code red and them that we, that we saw last summer, or um, other similar types of attacks. Also, we're interested in looking at infrastructure protection, and this is uh, part of the mission of ISTS, and in particular the group that I work in. The, they're wanting to detect either a coordinated attack against infrastructure or attacks against multiple infrastructure components. And this is something like where a, a group or individual may try to take out a particular sector of infrastructure, whether this is power generation, emergency response, communication systems, or either, either one sector on a, on a wide scale or multiple sectors of infrastructure within one local geographic area. Also, we want to try and reduce the overwhelming amount of data that's being produced by intrusion detection systems and reduce the uh, requirements and the, uh, the workload on the uh, security analyst to analyze this data and pull out what's really interesting out of all the noise that's uh, being generated on the systems. So we're interested in taking data that's already being generated out there and reorganizing it so it produces a clearer picture of what's going on. We're not trying to build a better intrusion detection system or even build a new type of sensor, but just make better use of information that's already out there on the systems and bring together information from various types of IDS, other types of network sensors as well, and use this along with some other knowledge about the relationships between these types of events and what we're seeing to be able to track the activities of, in, of individual attackers on the system. So kind of the, the traditional sort of view of a network 
is uh, kind of a very self-centered defensive position, uh, defensive viewpoint, where we're interested in keeping people out of our network, keeping uh, building a big wall around the castle, keeping the barbarians outside, trying to um, just keep people outside. But we're gathering only a partial, only part of the information of what's available uh, in regards to each person attacking the network. This gives us, this is, makes sense from a defensive point of view, but it doesn't give us very much information about the overall goals of someone that, whose attacks spread across multiple networks. So is a, it also, there's also weaknesses in this because there are certain types of attacks, such as a uh, distributed denial of service, where the, the actual victim of the attack need not be part of any of the uh, preparation stages. Well, we've got someone in the little scenario shown here where we've got uh, a number of systems out there. A couple of them are protected, a couple, few of them are not. And we've got someone that's attacking them. They're only able to get into the systems that are unprotected. But then later on, they're able to use these to launch a denial of service type attack against someone who is actually sitting behind some amount of protection. So, this person may not have seen or may not have been bothered by the initial stages, the sort of setting up the preparation, the zombie collection for the denial of service, but they still can be vulnerable to that type of attack. So we want to kind of change the view to more than a, a, a wider view to where we can get more information about each attacker out there and try and figure out what their goals are and what they're going after and get a more of an attacker-centered viewpoint. This uh, requires, of course, uh, one, gathering the data from the various systems, and then also being able to fuse it and correlate it in a meaningful fashion. So we're using uh, techniques that come out of the uh, realm of our radar tracking system, which is in some ways are very similar to what we're doing with IDS. We have multiple sensors, multiple types of sensors. We have multiple targets out there. We're trying to do this tracking and correlation in real time. Yes, and I have a nice little sound effect there. So we're taking this model and trying to apply it to one where the different types of intrusion, intrusion detection systems are our sensors and, and the targets that we're trying to tr uh, track are the people attacking our networks. So, as I said, there are two stages to this. The first is uh, gathering data, collecting it. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done in this area in the past and is currently being done as uh, well. A couple of the talks, other talks here at DEF CON this year, um, are focused on this. Um, so we're concentrating more on the uh, correlation aspect, trying to tell how various events are related. And we're doing this by... Um, a, uh, the basic assumption that the attacker's goals are going to determine their behavior, and different attackers with different goals are going to have different behavior, therefore they'll be recognizable for one another. And um, we're doing this through the use of multiple hypothesis tracking, which, um, just to give an overview of um, what uh, multiple hypothesis tracking is, if we uh, look at the radar tracking analogy again, at each time we do a radar sweep, we see two targets out there, and we see them moving in a certain fashion as they go as they uh, go through the space that we're looking at. But we're not sure exactly what's going on here because we, we can see what happens at each sort of sweep every time we get information from the sensors. But we're trying to now relate events from one sweep to another. So in these two cases, there are two possibilities that the, that the targets could have followed these two paths. We're trying to do a similar thing in determining the paths that a attacker has taken while, while going after uh, multiple systems. So in, this, in, in our system, we have, we have the tracking system, and it analyzes events that, it, uh, that are being collected from various IDSs, whether they be distributed across many networks or different types of IDS on a single network. And as these events arrive, they're analyzed. And for example, in this, if initially we get a port scan. That's all we've seen so far, so we know that the only possible scenario so far is that there is one attack occurring and it consists of that port scan. 
In the future, we also see a buffer overflow attack. Now there are two possibilities for what's going on out there. There could either be one person that's doing both of these, doing a uh, recon scan and then trying to break into the system, or they could be two unrelated um, attacks that just happen to be occurring at the same time. And we're trying to figure out, these are all multiple hypotheses, now we're trying to figure out which one of these is most likely the case. So we do this by uh, evaluating the hypotheses based both on the behavior of the attacker, uh, of, of the target, and of the uh, sensor. The, we want to know what real world event caused the reading that we're seeing off of our intrusion detection system, what actually happened out there to cause, to cause it to go off and give us an alert. And we also want to know how likely is it that someone would have, would have done this event and that how likely is it that someone that we saw before on our intrusion detection systems would have caused this event to occur. So I'll skip over the math for now. Um, so, for, um, for modeling the uh, sensors, we're, we're looking at the two basic uh, methods of intrusion detection system, either the signature detection or the um, statistical anomaly detection system. Of course, the signature has a very a low false positive, but it has a weakness of detecting only known attacks. The anomaly detection, higher false positive, but it has the chance of detecting a wider range of attacks. And we use these both on, of course, the host and network-based systems. So for modeling the sensors with uh, signature detection, it's fairly easy. If a known attack occurs in an observable area, the probability of detection is one. Otherwise, you're not going to see it. The anomaly detection is a bit more difficult. Uh, the type of attack, it, it's very, whether it detects something is very dependent on the type of attack. Noisy or unusual attacks are likely to be seen, things like denial service, port scams, uh, someone accessing unused services. Other types of attacks may be uh, missed more often by these, whether they be something that involves malformed web requests, some types of buffer overflows, things that look more like normal traffic. So, um, when we, so, also, when, we, when we're looking at the sensor, we're interested in the information that it's giving us, the, the, the measurements it's making about the particular event. And we try to look at a sort of a minimal feature set from the various IDS that we're using currently. Uh, this consists of the source destination IP, the ports, the type of the attack, and the time that the attack is occurring. These various measurements that we're taking about each attack are then used to describe a, a space through which the attacker is moving as they go through either various types of attacks against one system or, or attacking multiple systems out there. So in order to uh, evaluate, use this information to evaluate the uh, response of the sensor, we're using Bayesian inference. And this, this is used to solve the problem. Basically, when we have a sensor, an IDS out there, we know the forward response rate very well, meaning that we know that if, if a particular event, X, occurs out there, someone tries a particular attack, we know what the sensor is going to tell us. That's how they're designed. They're, they're designed to respond to their stimuli. But our problem is, is that we have to go through this backwards because our only view of the world is through the sensors. So we only see their output and we're trying to infer the input that caused that. So given the output, what was the real world event that occurred? So to do this, we look at both the forward response, which is known, and the prior distribution of X, meaning what's the likelihood of getting this sensor response we saw given a particular real world event? And also, what's the probability of that real world event actually having existed? What's the chance of that attack really having occurred? Or is it more likely that this was a false positive, something that probably wasn't occurring right now, or at least wasn't significant? So, modeling the attackers. They're not as easy to observe or model as the sensors, uh, mainly because we build and design the sensors and we can look at how they operate. And oftentimes these are all we can ever use to look at the, the people uh, attacking the networks. Um, so we have a very limited view of what's going on there at times. It's also very difficult to, uh, to describe the state of the attack, uh, which I'll discuss briefly in a moment. Um, 
so far with modeling the, the attackers, we've got, got used uh, three sources of data in this work. Uh, one is from uh, simulation that we've designed. Another is from uh, local networks that we have under our control. And also from the uh, Capture the Flag game here at DEF CON. So for the simulation, we use uh, pure, this is, there's a couple ways that we use simulation. One is in purely generated data. We just have a complete simulation. It, it simulates the, the network noise out there and the attacks occurring. We are, we, this is, of course, uh, highly controllable, good for the development stages. We also have generated attacks where it's a, a simulated attack that's inserted into normal network background noise that we record off of live networks. And this is uh, a little more realistic and a bit more interesting for testing purposes. So this is just a diagram of uh, one of our testing systems we've got on the uh, network at the engineering school. Uh, where we've got the main line coming into it. It goes through numbers of uh, switches. And we've got uh, IDS sat at various locations on the inside where we can either view these together or in isolation from one another. And we're, we're taking this to take the different segments of the network to pretend like they're a distributed system to try and gather information on each one and then correlate it together to see if we can pick up the big picture. We also have uh, another system out at a location at ISTS and another one with a, uh, a company uh, nearby in town to kind of get a wider picture of what's going on out there. So, and of course, like I said, we also use the uh, DEF CON capture the flag information. This data is unrealistic in some aspects because there's a general lack of uh, stealth, lack of network defenses, et cetera, uh, on the system. But what's great about it for our purposes is there's many, many attacks in many scenarios. A lot of the uh, more traditional uh, data sets for testing and evaluating IDS, such as the Lawrence Livermore data sets, they only have a uh, single event uh, attacks in them. They don't have sequences of events like someone coming in doing recon and then coming back and attacking particular systems or trying to attack one system and go to another. They're just individual events so they're not very, it doesn't help us for trying to develop correlation techniques. Uh, but of course the capture to the flag game does have this. Um, for example, um, and this is from the uh, from two years ago in a, in a 2.5 hour time slice of the network data, there was a playback against network intrusion detection systems. There were over 16,000 events registered on it. Um, these were um, uh, Oliver Dane and Robert Cunningham from Lincoln Labs. I think, well, I think Oliver Dane mainly hand classified these into scenarios, went through all these events and figured out what was really going on. And there were about 89 individual scenarios in this two and a half hour time slice. So the, the state problem of the attack, basically without getting into too much detail about this, in a traditional tracking system, you want to be able to describe the state that the attacker's in in as simple terms as possible, like for an airplane, give it its you know, X, Y, and Z position and its velocities. It's a little diff more difficult to do this with an attack because the space that the attack's moving through is uh, non-linear and non-contiguous. So there's no simple method for describing the state. So what we do is we use a, a small history of events in each track to describe the state of the attack and to see whether a new event coming in fits in with this short history that we keep. So we use um, a sort of a, a windowed history of previous events and look at the relationship between the new event we're, we're trying to fit into this track to see if it fits in there, compare it to the previous event and the event before that and the event before that. But give, uh, we have a weighting function so we can give more weight to the more recent events. So we calculate the relationships between the pairs and sequences of events here to see if the new event makes sense with what has come before it. So one thing that's important to keep in mind here is, like, is that for describing the state of an attack, we don't really care how they got to this state, how, they got, how the attack got to this point. We just care which state it's in. We, we don't need to know the entire sequence, just enough so we can differentiate one from another. 
um, in doing to do this, uh, we use uh, some. We need uh, some predictive model that can give us an idea based on what we've seen before, what's likely to happen in the future, what's unlikely to happen in the future. And this is where the different types of attacks, the different things someone's going after, are going to have a different uh, distribution, different probability distribution of what's occurring. Um, for example, in these two, uh, in the two graphs here, one is one shows a probability distribution for events on someone that's scanning a network that's doing some sort of reconnaissance, and the other is for denial of service. On, on these graphs, basically, the further over to the right something is, that's the faster the events are arriving. So in a denial of service, things occur very quickly, otherwise it wouldn't be much of a denial of service. On the, um, on the going, going back into the graph, um, kind of along these axis, this shows the sort of spread in source IP addresses that we're seeing. Something like a distributed denial of service, we're going to obviously see things coming from many different IP addresses. Something from a scanning attack, chances are, in, mo in, in most cases, they're all going to be coming from a similar area uh, of the internet, if it's the same person. So, uh, this is these. Th this chart. This shows just a couple feature sets, sort of the IP source uh, spread and the uh, the arrival rate of the events. So we're interested in trying to figure out what features out of the uh, what we're measuring give good information. So. Um, to, so we, we've been looking at the historical data sets from either what we've captured off of the Thayer network or from the capture of the flag game to see what makes good differentiating features for these events. Um, let me just, well, so basically, this is just, all, all this is showing here is it's looking at those two graphs that we saw uh, on the uh, previous chart. Now they're plotted against each other, looking at one axis at a time. Over on the left is the arrival rate. Over on the right, we're looking at the spread on the source IP address. And there's significant, you can see there's significant more overlap on the arrival rate than there is on the uh, spread on the source net mass. This means that looking at the, at the IP source that things are coming from is much more likely to be able to differentiate between uh, different types of attacks than the arrival rate for these two scenarios. When we look at this against uh, historical data that we have, um, and what, what, what this is showing is the, uh, the numbers are showing the, uh, the amount of overlap between the various types of attacks depending on how fine of a, of a um, well, I'm not going to get into the, the great thing. It takes too long to explain right now. But the, it's showing, basically, this is showing how much overlap there is between the various uh, combinations of feature sets. Uh, 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 this, is taken, this was taken from the, uh, the capture the flag data from uh, last year's game. So let me time purposes, just skip ahead a bit. As, um, well, just the stuff I skipped over was just basically explaining that after we determine what are good feature sets, we've been using a machine learning approach uh, to then classify the events. It, we feed the, the various relationships between, and the feature sets, how, how well they match up on this, on a particular set of features feeds into a uh, machine learning system using neural nets to try and then differentiate the events as they come in and uh, separate them off into the various tracks. As in the multiple hypothesis tracking uh, method, as new events come in, we make all the possible hypotheses of what could have happened and then try to evaluate them to determine which one is the most likely. In the brute force approach, uh, the number of hypotheses we have to maintain doubles every time we have an event arrive. So it grows very quickly if we don't uh, prune back very aggressively. Um, so in traditional hypothesis tracking, you create all the hypotheses and then prune away the ones that don't seem very likely. We have to be a little more aggressive in ours where we have a more selective branching where if we look at something and it's clearly a winner, if it clearly fits in with a scenario that already exists, we don't bother uh, 
branching on other possibilities. We just put it in the one we think it is and, and go on from there. If there's no clear winner in the uh, for this particular event, if, it, if it's not if it's not absolutely clear which scenario it goes in, then we branch and maintain these hypotheses for a while until there's more events in them and there's more evidence to try and determine which one is the most likely, which one uh, appears to be the real set of events that occurred. Um, in order to cut down on some of the data and, and to cut down on the number of hypotheses, uh, we do some pre-processing where some uh, sequences of events that are simply related are pulled out and turned into single meta-events immediately, either things like port scans where it's very obvious they're all coming from the same place. Um, these are very noisy, you know, they generate lots of events, would cause the system to get bogged down. But uh, by pulling these out and turning them a, a number of events into a single event, we reduce some of the computational workload on the system. Uh, let me skip this. Um, with the uh, a bit about the testing and evaluation, we've uh, done this on both the data collected from the from the Thayer and ISTS networks that we have live data on, and from uh, some of the DEF CON data sets over the past few years. Um, on, on these, uh, we used the data sets earlier uh, with the probability distribution method, and now the machine learning approach has been applied to the DEF CON data sets. On our, uh, the, on the third data set, we had a uh, set of data had about 1,500 events. These are actual intrusion sensor, um, intrusion detection system alerts on here. They consisted of about 20 scenarios and a bunch, about 50% of the events were all single events unrelated to other things going on. Um, when we, this chart shows the accuracy of the system in placing events into scenarios uh, based on the number of hypotheses the system is allowed to maintain. When we had a very low number of hypotheses, it doesn't do very well because it's, you're not looking as, at, many, as, at many possibilities, at as many possibilities. So if a mistake is made in, in the hypothesis early on, it's corrupted and it's not going to give you, you're not going to have the right, when, when you make the limited number of hypotheses, if the correct one isn't in the set that you decide to keep and promote on to the next generation for future evaluation, it's going to be corrupted forever and you're never going to get the right answer out of this. So as we let the number of hypotheses grow, we got up to about, it was about an 89% accuracy on placing events and scenarios with the, uh, the Thayer t set. On the uh, DEF CON set, this is a, uh, from the DEF CON, DEF CON 9 Capture the Flag, which was interesting. Was last year at DEF CON, they, they, they changed the way the data was collected a little bit, and that it was collected from multiple points on the network, which was more interesting from us, because that gave us different, essentially different IDS to try and correlate events in between. Um, on this one, and this is using the uh, machine learning approach, it's a little, it's less stable earlier on, but eventually we got up to about a 95% accuracy with enough uh, hypotheses uh, allowed to maintain. One issue with this is this shows the number, this is based on evaluating how many of the actual events in the scenario did it get. A lot of the hypotheses also had extra garbage events in them, but that's something that we're, well, it's an area for improvement. It's something we're not that concerned with right now because if we can pull out the scenarios and the actual sequences of events that are related and put those together, even if there's some noise in, the, in those, it still creates a much clearer picture than what we had prior to that. So... Just uh, give a quick summary here. Um, what, we're, what we're doing with this is reorganizing data that's out there. We're trying to look at what, what's already being generated and make better use of it, make the uh, job of the system analyst a bit easier. Uh, we provide a higher level view, kind of, a, kind of like the, the, um, the overhead view to uh, see what's going on on each network, see what each attacker is trying to do across multiple networks, reduce the work of the security analysts, and uh, through the application of uh, some uh, uh, techniques out of our radar tracking systems. 
some of the uh, future and well now current work as well on this is to incorporate a wider variety of sensors, some more host-based IDS uh, system logs, things such as that, to try and get multiple views of the same sort of attacks to help try and reduce the false positive uh, rate on the system. That if you can correlate what your network IDS is telling you is an attack that's out there on the, on the wire with what the hosts are actually seeing on themselves to know whether it was actually a successful attack or not, whether it's something that you need to be worried about or not. And also integration with other network analysis tools. And also we're interested in incorporating this with a few other uh, of the projects out at ISTS. One of these is a um, the distributed ICMP backscatter, which this is a uh, system where they've uh, where we've uh, modified the uh, the kernels and uh, certain routers to uh, report back to a central logging facility when they're seeing large amounts of ICMP um, ICMP data or packets coming back through them that would be seen when you have a worm that's going out there and scanning large portions of the internet and hitting. Uh, many places try, trying to scan for many hosts that don't actually exist out there. You get this sort of this flood of IC, ICMP traffic coming back to uh, the source of the uh, scan. The, um, and by looking at this over on a wide scale and trying to correlate this from many areas, we hope to try and sort of pinpoint where the worm is coming from very early on in its scanning stages. Another thing is the, uh, in the uh, BGP border gateway protocol routing analysis, we're looking at um, the information being passed back and forth by the uh, border gateways where they, uh, where, as they propagate their known routes around the system, that we're gathering information from these scattered around the world and trying to determine when certain systems are being routed around, when there are problems in certain parts of the internet, to try and uh, identify it by the updates to the uh, routing tables. And of course, as always, uh, you know, larger scale implementation and address all the scaling and timing communications issues uh, that are, uh, occur with that. So uh, that about does it. So if there's uh, any questions now, be I, I can't hear you. Okay. The, uh, the question was, uh, how do I get a copy? And, um, well, it's not available right now, but, it, um, but w within the next few months, we're hoping to have something that's up and available, and it'll be uh, at uh, www.ists.dartmouth.edu. Um, and this, um, I think there's a bit of information about this. It's in the, uh, the version of the talk that's on the CD that, that you were given about the location. I saw some other question. Or maybe it was the same question. Yes. Um, the, the question was in the DEFCON analysis if we use the, what the guys from Lincoln Labs provided as the correct uh, set of scenarios to evaluate ours against. We did that with, the, uh, with what they did, which was that two and a half hour time slice as a starting point. Actually, in, but what was shown in the graph here was actually from DEFCON. That was from two years ago. From last year, we went through and, had, and did sections of it by ourselves. We classified the, uh, we, we took this, the data from the uh, capture the flight game last year and went through it by hand, like the guys at Lincoln Labs did, and um, made our own judgments as to what we think it was the correct scenario. I'm sorry? Uh, the question was, how does the system deal with uh, data set poisoning? And that was something that we haven't really, that was something we haven't really addressed yet. That uh, certainly, um, if you know that this thing is out there looking at what you're doing, you could, um, you could, you could uh, damage its evaluation by giving a lot of garbage data out there. But in a lot of cases, the sort of traditional methods of trying to um, 
to cause that sort of garbage data and to create a lot of noise, or one of the things that this tries to correlate and pull out of the system. So it's, I, I, I wouldn't go as far to say that it's safe or does well against that because we didn't really test it against that, but it's, it's by the nature of the system, it, it should be able to handle that at least with some, perhaps some modification from how it operates now. Yes, the question was, is the traffic capture from the capture of the flag available? And it is, it's uh, the SHMU group, which is uh, www.shmoo, and I think it's the .org, but it might be .com, or .org? Yeah, .org. Uh, and they've made the uh, capture of the flag data. They record the raw network data uh, off the capture of the flag game, uh, and it's a lot of data, but they make it publicly available for research purposes. The uh, question was, uh, do we take into account sensors running different IDS policies on them, and how does that affect uh, what, we're, what we're seeing? But that's taken into effect in the, in the sensor modeling stage that um, there's a part where we talked about if, when you're looking at, like, say it's a signature-based IDS, that its probability of detecting something is based on, one, what it's looking for in the area that it looks in, and basically what it's looking for is directly correlated to the, uh, uh, to, to how you have it configured. So that, that is taken into account there. Um, and it's mainly, it's, it's important to kind of know what you're not looking for. So if, you, if something's missing in the scenario, the, it can be explained away as not being seen because we should have seen it, but the reason we didn't see it is because we weren't looking for it. Uh, the question was, what's the minimum number of sequences in an event it takes to accurate correlation? And that's very dependent on what what the the sequence is, what type of attack it is. Um, with with certain types of attacks, when you have uh, if you have it, it's 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 highly dependent on that. That it's um, something like where you see like a uh, recon coming in, and then attacks that are going after what was reconned. It doesn't, it doesn't take much because they're very similar on a lot of feature sets. The things that are a little more uh, out there and separated, it's, um, it, gets, um, it gets more difficult quickly. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard thing to answer because it depends on uh, with the type of attack, how many, uh, what's kind of like the, the event rate of the attack, things like scans. Uh, high events. If it's just a single buffer overflow attack sort of coming in and then not, not much else happening, um, you put, oftentimes there's not enough information in that to do accurate correlation. So. Well, I think if that's about it, it looks like it's about to o'clock.